myself again. Hi and welcome to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Ray. As always, uh, we have uh, a special show now and again uh, with uh, friends of mine who are authors and it's a delight to, to welcome back for the second time, Richard Booth. How are you, my friend? Hi, Steve. Good to see you again, mate. Nice yeah, to be here. Good to see you, mate. Great to have you on. And uh, we're here uh, to talk about another collaboration between you and our mutual friend, Charles Salvador. It's a book called Words from the Soul. Congratulations, mate. You're uh, knocking these quicker and uh, knocking these out quicker than uh, uh, J.K. Rowland. I know. Uh, that, that's the that's the uh, virtue of lockdown. That even though I've been busy, it allows you a bit of free time, free time to try and sort these things out. And yeah, it's our second collaboration, and um, we're both really proud of this. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we'll talk a little bit about the book uh, later, um, just to refresh people's memories who uh, are watching this today. Uh, how did you first get to meet uh, or get involved with Charlie Salvador? Okay, so it's oh, it's five years or so now since I first got involved with Charlie. Uh, it stemmed from I I've been working on a, a project to to uh, develop interactive resources to support both young offenders and mainstream offender learners. Um, and it stemmed from there going back now. The project, the first part part of the project, three four years down the line. Um, and before that, I got in touch with Charlie and said I'd love to use your artwork to illustrate that the, the aspects of the prison resource I want to create and obviously use some of your words for inspiration because there's no one better than you can inspire people not to turn to crime and stay away from prison. So that's how I first got involved with Charlie. Um, and over the years, we've, we've become really good friends. And I think that friendship, out of something that I was initially working with from a project, has come into a sort of a real life friendship. And um, yeah, we've got a lot of respect for each other. We share a love of of art, poetry and various things. So, um, yeah, you know, something's good come out of that. And now we're trying to just uh, continue with these collaborative projects to uh, give each of us something to uh, work towards. It's quite a strict process to actually, you know, get in and visit Charlie. Um, what was it like when you when you first actually met him face to face? OK, well, when I first met Charlie face to face, it, it was in Franklin. And at that time, Charlie was on close visits. So, it was behind plate glass, so it's not as it's not as good as as it is now. And as you've have you've experienced yourself, Steve, having sort of your uh, uh, face to face visit. So um, yeah, it, it was nice because the first time I'd met the man himself. So we you know we had a really good chat, but through glass, it's not as personable. Um, but from that, we you know we did establish a really good sort of friendship. And um, yeah, I, I look back on some of those close visits as fond memories because you know you can have a laugh and a laugh and a joke but in more recent years being at Wood Hill where it's open visits you could be more relaxed you know as you as you know when we've met together with, with Charlie you know you're in a room you know you can have a drink of tea you, you can socialize a lot more and it, it I think it brings it on to Charlie that's a more personalized thing you know as opposed to being in solitary and locked up and behind closed visits you get that sort of tangible face-to-face uh, -face interaction which I think is you know, is very much um, needed from from both parties. The media have often portrayed him as a as a monster, as a madman, as Britain's most dangerous prisoner. But what's Charlie Salvador like uh, from your perspective? Okay, yeah, I mean, obviously that is the that is the the persona that is is perceived in the press, and I think that's what the public at large think. Because I still get asked now, you know, well, how many people has Charlie killed? He's not killed anybody, you know. And I think behind the person, when you break down that facade, that's been sort of etched into people's mind for decades from the press and the media. Um, I find somebody who's a friendly, approachable and an emotional person. As our poetry book and as your poetry book you did with Charlie sort of references, there's the, the softer side to the He's a person at the end of the day. You know, I know people think of him as this sort of world's most notorious britain's most notorious criminal but there's a real person behind that uh, and i think that shines out in some of the words he, he's put together in his poems in his writing uh, and obviously through his art so i, I see a person who's uh, more deserved his time on the outside and um, obviously he's paid from his crimes but um you know we class each other as our best friends you know and um you know, you, I, neither of us takes that lightly. And I, I think that's testament to, to the person he is. You know, the, there's a, a more caring, uh, approachable side of Charlie that people really 
give him credit for, and especially the work he does with the charities, you know, where he's always thinking of others. Uh, and that's something I think most people don't associate with somebody like Charlie. You mentioned his artwork earlier on. I mean, I guess, you know, that's how Charlie spent a lot of his time and how he's kept himself sane. And, and people, are, you know, will have seen his artwork. I'm sure there's plenty of examples of it on the, on the internet. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's unique, isn't it? His style. It is unique, and I, and I, and I think, um, you know, over the time, and we've got Mike O'Hagan to, to thank for that, who first gave Charlie his, his paper and his pencils way back when he said to him, you know, if you want to express yourself, express yourself through art. And I think he's developed his own unique style, and from that he's got imagery in there which shows the incarceration he's endured over the last 47 years, you know, being in solitary and the treatment he has. And um, yeah, it's become it's become very unique and, and personalised. And um, you know, I think a lot of people who see Charlie's work see something different. And there's so much in there, you can't help but be wowed by you know the the imagery that you see. Um, there's something for everybody. And I and uh, yeah, um, his art still astounds me out today. You know. Tell us about the first book that you did. We we touched on it, and you can find the interview in the uh, the Charles Salvador playlist. Uh, tell us about Broadmarsh. What what was behind that? Okay, well, Broadmarsh uh, basically uh, we're we're going back now probably eighteen months, and it was just prior to lockdown, I suppose. Um, Charlie said to me on a visit, he said, "How do you fancy writing a novel?" You know, I said, "Well, I've I've never thought of writing a novel," and he hadn't either. And he said, "I think it'd be a good project." So Charlie came up with the concept of Broadmarsh. Uh, you know, did a few introductory chapters. I, I sort of um, uh, edited them. I came up with the rest of them. And we came up with this book, which is set in 1956. Uh, and it's set around Frankie Johnson, who was this sort of wayward son, um, I think because his father and his grandfather had, had served time and, you know, uh, experienced uh, a, a life of crime and unfortunately were hanged. Uh, I think... Frank thought he was going down the same path, of which he did. He did a few murders. Uh, and at the time, the judge presided and wanted him to hang. But uh, they said during the court case he was a, a reason of insanity, so they couldn't hang him. Uh, so they, they sent him to Broadmarsh, which is one of the most secret, secretive, cruel of, uh, uh, of institutions, asylums in the country. And it was based up in Yorkshire. And it's where the Home Office kept things quiet. You know, this was a place where all the worst kind of uh, of criminals uh, resided, but they were free to do what they wanted with them. Um, and Frank knew if he didn't get out of there, he would die. Uh, and he plotted his, his escape and went on a basically a, a killing rampage across London and uh, further afield. So, um, yeah, I, I think he had a bad upbringing. Um, you know, he, he certainly uh, uh, wreaked havoc. Uh, but there's a softer side to it. Later on, he finds somebody uh, called Susie who was uh, uh, abused in a children's home and they found this sort of uh, a kinship of love. And I think it's the first time somebody had showed him emotion and love. And yeah, it's a roller coaster ride. I know some people who, who, who read it said that uh, some of them were scared half to death. Um, <laughs> and I have to keep telling people it's fictitious. Some people who said they were doing a pilgrimage to Yorkshire to find Broadmarsh, it, it doesn't exist. Um, and also Charlie and I went to some strange parts of our minds to sort of come up with the character and some of the things that happened. And we had to sort of stress as well. It's not it's not our mindset in the, in the normal guys of things. You know, we, we, we sent it, uh, as it said, to Helen back. And um, yeah, again, we were really proud with that. That was our first partnership. And from initial concept to having it published, it was 13 months. So Charlie always said we turned something as, as the lockdown and COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, a negative into a positive. And um, yeah, that was the first of many projects that we, we we started. Sign of a good book when people start looking for the place. It shows you how believable it, it, it actually is. Thank God it doesn't exist, by the way. Um, yeah. I mean, is there any plans to, to, to follow up with a sequel? I mean, obviously I know how it ends and I don't want to spoil it for people. So yeah. there would need to be, there would need to be some of that. Um, you know, some other plot line, some other storyline and some other characters. But um, is there a plan for another novel? There is, yeah. We, we, we've started to flesh out the, the, the part two because, uh, as you said, I don't want to give the game away. There's something that will continue from that. And, uh, yeah, that's something we've got on the pipeline possibly next year to have that released. 
Brilliant. Um, but but in the inter intervening time, we, you know, we wanted to write a poetry book. And, and as I've mentioned earlier, I know you and Charlie brought out a poetry book, which was well received. And I think it was brilliant. Um, and we just decided to bring out our own because we've both been writing poetry for a hell of a long time. And this was our anthology. And um, Have yeah, you always really written poetry, Richard? Yeah, I, I've been I've been writing poetry for probably 30 plus years, maybe longer. Um, yeah, I, I wrote poems for my wife. I, I used to work away from when we had our house. So I was teaching up in Manchester. So I used to send her a poem every week. And whenever we went on holiday, if we went to the States or anywhere, I used to keep a journal and I'd always write poetry. So most of the poems in the book are stem from uh, my my journals over the years. Uh, but both Charlie and I have wrote new poems specifically for the book as well. So um, there's a lot of older unpublished stuff and some newer stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, I've always had a love of poem and poetry and uh, different poets. Yeah. And Charlie has as well, which I mean, you know, you've, you've mentioned, obviously, we did Words Inside and Out together, which was a big success yeah. and continues to sell uh, to this day. And it was, you know, my poetry wasn't something that I'd, I'd, I'd continued with. It was something I wrote when I was when I was in my 20s, um, was stashed away in the loft. And I remember just having a conversation on a visit with Charlie. I think you were there and I mentioned yeah. it and he said, well, I've got some. Why don't we put it together? And I think just the unique combination of Charlie's artwork and my poetry and his poetry and 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 you know it, it was a big success it's something a bit different but it shows a different side to charlie doesn't it the, his poetry it does yeah and i know when i spoke to the press about our book and stuff it does show a different side to charlie i, I think some of the words that is produced uh, show the caring nature of charlie that uh, the person he is uh, and obviously it brings forth uh, some of the things he's had to deal with you know some of the horrible treatment and uh, especially some of the poems he's done uh, around his time in Broadmoor you know they they really are horrific uh, but on the flip side you've, you've got the caring nature like he wrote an amazing tribute poem to Caroline Flack when she unfortunately passed away so it, it shows that that different side of him and, and as we've spoke about before and we mentioned earlier I think it breaks down that facade that has been built up rightly or wrongly in the British press for the last you know 47 years or so you know um it, it shows the different side of him and uh i think that's what poetry brings to people uh we've put that on, on the book as well we hope that when people read the words in the poems that they actually think about the the uh, situations that cause rise for charlie and i to put pen to paper and especially charlie's poems and i think people then can have their own sort of mental image of what he was trying to convey successfully on the page yeah, it's rather a distinctive cover. Uh, obviously, I've got the book there in front of us. Thanks for sending, thanks to you and Charlie for yeah. sending me the copy. What was the idea behind the cover, Richard? Okay, well, Charlie, Charlie had done uh, the artwork, which was basically one of the cell doors, um, and uh, he sent that to me. And we were discussing it over the phone. And I said, oh, I just love the way that the hands coming out with the rose, and again, that shows the human emotion of somebody in there. And with the with the with the dripping of the blood from the flower, I said. That, that could be a really good cover for the poetry book. Uh, and I came up with words from the soul because uh, I said, you know, it, people always say words from the heart. I said, you know, you, you're bearing your soul to the words of, of your poems. Uh, and then we decided to continue with the dripping of the blood down. So it, it's sort of showing on there that, you know, behind the, the prison door where everyone thinks you, you're locked away, in, uh, there's a soul trying to get out, you know, and more, no more so in Charlie's um sort of situation and i just thought it felt it it, it, it captured it perfectly uh, and within the book as well we've got we've got the artwork that charlie's done specifically for some of the poems that conjures up the the sort of imagery that we were trying to portray um and as you did with your book as well you know i made sure that not only have we got the type words we've got uh, the original written handwritten ma manuscripts and the, and the actual artwork and for photographs as well, that sort of give you the imagery of, of what the words were conveying. And um, I hope people think it's as successful as, as we feel it is. And, you know, we're really, really proud of it. Charlie dedicates the book uh, to all those who struggle with mental health conditions every day. I thought that, that was that was quite a nice gesture, especially after coming out of COVID and lockdown. It's something which he's thought a great deal about over the last 12 months. Yeah, we, we both have. I mean, with my prison project as well, I've done a hell of a lot of resources to support prisons with mental health conditions. And obviously it's on the rise every year in and out of prison, but no no more so, as you've mentioned, since sort of the lockdown. I think a lot of people, have, their mental health conditions have gone through the roof. And, um, you know, you, you've got to think of the people 
in and out of prison who who uh, don't get that break. Uh, and yeah, we both said we'll we'll dedicate it to that. But also, Charlie's dedicated the book to his his mum Ira as well, um, somebody that he cares a lot about. And in fact, she she features in one of his two of his poems actually. Um, so yeah, that is a really nice touch. And again, that shows the caring nature of Charlie as well. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the technology, because obviously, as you flick through the pages of the book, um, there's a little uh, what I would describe as probably like a lightning bolt. And then yeah. next to that, it says, listen to Charlie reading this poem or listen to Richard reading this poem. New bit of technology. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, for the last 10 years or so, I've been developing uh, augmented reality which in it's sort of like the technology terms it is is uh, superimposing a computer image view of the world over over line so basically if people are used to things like qr codes it's like a qr code on steroids i always say and basically it allows the reader or the person who's interacting with with the page in this instance the poems to take an app which is uh, i've been using called zapper uh, and once it's downloaded to your android or iphone uh, or any sort of mobile device you can trigger that little zap code and it will then bring you up the the, the digital content. And in, in this instant, it is audio. So it means then once you're looking on the written page of the poem by either myself and Charlie, you can then trigger it to hear us narrating those words as well. And I think that gives you a, a different depth because not only can you read the words and interpret it in your own mind, but actually hearing the poet doing that as well i think it it gives you their emotion behind it and and um, it's something quite different augmented reality has been used for years by big corporations but as far as i'm aware this is the first time it's been used within the poetry book uh, and i said to charlie we need to do this because it just gives it that bigger depth it makes it a little bit more interesting so you've got a lot of stuff in there you've got interactive content you've got the written words and you've got the art form which i think brings up you know a really unique sort of um uh, booklet really uh, and it's 209 pages so it's quite a quite a size for a poetry book and um yeah it's just something extra for the for the reader to sort of uh, capture i mean with your poetry is it just something that you, you you'll think of you, you know you might you might have something happens to you during the day or you meet somebody or something inspires you uh, and then you jot it down is that what you tend to do yeah um i mean obviously i i've I wrote poems for my wife so obviously that that's sort of the emotion nature of the love for somebody but like in the book uh, one of the poems i wrote was was in reference to the kosovo war that happened in 1999 and the atrocity that happened there and i just felt i had to put some sort of words down and instead of actually writing a journal type i, I started to write poetry so a lot of it stems from that it's sort of anything that takes me really i think it's uh things i've seen that i capture better instead of doing an art piece I've, I've done a poem and for me it describes it uh and by rights most of my poems unlike charlie's don't rhyme uh the only one in the book i think which actually rhymes charlie asked me would i write a poem um when he went to leeds crown court when he was up on the charge where he was fine not guilty uh and he said oh I, i've done one for leeds crown court if you don't do one as well it'd be great so i, I woke up at 4 a.m one day and i told charlie i had i had the words down to a t uh, and i woke up at four and wrote it out in 10 minutes and um i was really pleased with that poem i think it's my last poem in the back end of the book before we have some supporter poems and uh, i read it out to charlie on the phone because i love it that that just captures what happened at Leeds Crown Court, you know, the, the farcical aspect of it, which, which happened during the, the few days he was there. So, yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm pleased at that, you know, something I can just get in my mind and put down on paper and um, and it, it worked. We're going to give uh, the viewers a chance to uh, hear a couple of poems. Um, while you're listening to Charlie Reader, what about this young lady? Um, you can yes. see that there, Kelly. Um, I'd like you to select a poem from your like from your book um, and you can read one out as well after we've listened to Charlie. Now, I'm going to have to make a, a quick technical change here for us to yeah. be able to play this. Uh, okay. But this is, this is an example of what you can find in the book. Kelly. No one gives a massage like Kelly. Sometimes she sits on your belly. I'm 
brilliant that isn't it um, when you listen oh, we, we've listened to that so many times and oh, i'll tell you it was it was uh yeah that was one for the extras yeah it, and it, again it, 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 you know you've got this point that's quite simple but when he started laughing i started laughing that it we, we just lost it yeah 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 fantastic but i mean there's some great poems in in, in that book and um obviously you know you've written some as well have you managed to pick one out of your own richard yeah, what I thought I would do, because we discussed it, I'll read you the one that I wrote at 4 a.m. Uh, that yeah. morning at uh, Leeds Crane Court. Okay, so this is basically, this is, um, and, and I've, I've put a bit of information in the back which talks about, this was when Charlie went to Leeds Crane Court in November 2018, uh, when he represented himself, actually, after being charged with attempting to attack a pris prison officer in Wakefield, of which he was found not guilty. So this is my take of what happened over the three days, okay? So it's Lee's Crown Court, November 2018. 
Not guilty, Your Honour. Not guilty, that's me. Even the fine people of the jury can see. Travel for in the sweat box, dressed in my yellow and greens. Nobody understands truly what that means. I should be wearing my very best suit and tie, not looking like the convict that is guilty. Why? Changes to the jury, no vested interest needed here. The ones that left are the people that I hold dear. I gave it my all, everyone could see. A not gu guilty verdict it had to be. Even the judge presiding over the case had a smile for me all over his face. For many a day, the defence and prosecution put forward their claims. Could it be that I cannot be tamed? The press looked on and savoured every word with statements they could not believe just what they'd heard. Something was not right in the prosecution figures and facts. It looked like a comedy played out in five acts. At the end of the day, I only wanted to hug my fellow man. You can still have pleasantries, even though you live life in the can. After many had passed, the day finally arrived. The verdict was in. Had I survived? The judge shouted out, not guilty in Leeds Crown Court. A sigh of relief. The press had their report. And there you have it. Charlie had won. And back to Franklin before the falling sun. Yeah, so that was my my take on that Leeds Crown Court. And uh, yeah, it just, I, and I think it's one of the only ones that rhyme in the book because I tend to do poetry that doesn't rhyme. Um, and hopefully it's got a lot of things in there for people. Um, and if anybody's interested, we, we, the book is actually released on Monday or the 20th of September. Uh, we've got a limited edition, very strictly limited edition of 50 signed, numbered and embossed copies that are in colour. Uh, and it's also going to be released as a, a standard black and white edition from ourselves signed or it's going to be available on Amazon worldwide as well, unsigned copies. So um, I hope you, you, if you buy a copy, we hope you enjoy it. Yeah, great stuff. We're going to stick the link down below in the description so people can buy it. But um, I'm going to finish off uh, the interview with uh, a few words from the man himself, Charles Salvador, who, of course, uh, left me a message uh, on the answering machine. Uh, here we go. AM. Yeah. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Uh, as, as always, great to hear from Charlie and uh, thank you for the answering machine message. Uh, but a good review, a glowing endorsement of a great job. Well done, Richard. Yeah, no, I'm, I, 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 you know, you, you can't do more than and get that sort of appreciation from the man that you, you know you've helped produ produce it with, and uh, yeah, we're both really proud of it. And I just hope people like it too, because it, it's something different than writing a novel or a book, as you, as you well aware, Steve, because you bear, you are bearing your soul, and usually poems are private. Um, so um, you know, most of those poems, indeed, of most all of them are unpublished. So. You are bearing your soul to the world, and we hope people find something uh, that they can interpret in their own lives through those words as well. So, yeah. Well, best of luck with it. The link's below. Uh, get ordering on the 20th of September onwards. Get those limited edition ones because they're well worth the money, uh, especially signed by both authors. Uh, Richard, look forward to the next publication soon and look forward to seeing you one day back on a visit with Charlie. But uh, until yeah. then, take care, mate. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.